Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this fun Fellowship Friday night for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Maybe it's easier just to call a CES if you like. But I think Church of the Eternally Secure is important. I mean, we put eternally secure in the name of the church. So you, you should understand how important that doctrine is to us. All right. I can't help it. I... I, I start, start preaching and, uh, and oh, woo, woo, let's get going. The Holy Spirit's coming tonight. <laughs> Come on, everybody. Are you going to ready to have some fun? Uh, let's let's first find out if uh, Sister Lisa has her audio working yet. Lisa. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, it is working. Well, while we can hear you, would you like to give a greeting to the congregation? Yeah, praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Hope everyone is doing well this evening. Um, I know I'm ready to have a little fun and fellowship today. The devil been busy in my life all day trying to start all kind of mess and craziness, but he's still a liar, and I'm glad to be here tonight. Awesome. Well, we all rebuke him in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Right. Uh, okay, Brother Ben, since you uh, spoke, you have to go next. Say hi to everybody. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here, seeing some new faces in chat and some old uh, old friends and brother. Uh, it's good to be here once again. I think we have a good set of uh, true-false questions to consider tonight. <laughs> okay. I think my little outburst there might have uh, shocked a few people. Uh, all right. Uh, Brother Steve, say hi. Hi. That's it. No more. Okay, Steve, Steve, you can go home now. Okay. Where where is that? That's a long way. I'm a long way from home now. So at least a day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're you're already comfortably home on the road, I guess. Um, I all right. Yeah. Uh, maybe you've already noticed if you've been looking, uh, you can see that uh, there's a big capital R here. That stands for Renee Rowland. Sister Renee, the untwisted sister, has agreed to join us tonight uh, because Sister Angel has uh, unfortunately not available tonight. So, uh, hello, Sister Renee. Hey, Brother Luke. Kevin said you're scared as cat. <laughs> no, I, know, I apologize. I don't know what came over me. <laughs> it's good to hear your voice. Hadn't talked to you in a while. I'm, I'm happy to see everybody tonight. And I'm looking forward to hanging out with you guys. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, we're ready to have fun. Let's see if the chat room's ready. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I recognize a lot of these names. But I, I see some new names here, too. Let me see. Lisa Good. Hello, Lisa. I, maybe you've been here before, but I didn't don't recognize the name. So, so welcome. And uh, Abby Sanchez, Darth Sidious. I don't know. That name kind of scares me. Uh, get to the Pond, Melvin Hernandez. I, I, I see a lot of names I don't recognize. So if you're new, uh, uh, welcome. I, I hope you have a great time with us tonight. Uh, and maybe you'll, you'll join us for our, our other programs throughout the week. Um, all right. Um, is there anything we need to uh, uh, discuss before we go right into the uh, true and false part of the program? Anyone? All right, then. All right, Brother Ben, why don't you post the first true false question for us? Okay, the tr first true false question is someone may come to Christ only for quote unquote fire insurance. Wow. And I modified that slightly from the original uh, just to make it a little bit more. Uh, clear, I think. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, it. I think we've all heard that uh, charge uh, before. Before, uh, can you tell us who uh, submitted the question? Uh, I'm not at liberty to, unless they want to chime chime in. Oh, okay, but it's no one on the panel. Oh. Oh no, no it was me. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> you right. could have snitched on me. I didn't mind, brother man. No, the okay. only reason I asked the question <laughs> is, is uh, we we kind of agreed that. If you submit the question, that you you go last. You're mm -hmm, turning. That's down. fine. That's the only reason. Okay. I so, have no problem with that. All okay. right, and we'll do that. Who wants to go first on this? Oh, Luke, I want to say something on this. Yeah, go ahead. Because uh, I know Lisa has gotten this accusation 
many times, and I have too. And what the question implies is that when they got saved or they believed, they had more honorable intentions than we did. They came to God and believed because they were good and they wanted a relationship and they wanted, I mean, they have better intentions than the rest of us who simply just want our fire insurance. And that's what that kind of question actually props up. It's saying, I, when I, when I believe I didn't do it just to not go to hell, I did it because I had honorable intentions. I wanted to have a relationship and I love God and you only did it so you wouldn't go to hell. That, that's what the question props up in the very asking of it. But I would say, uh, yeah, because it says save some with fear of the fire. And if Jesus didn't save us from judgment, what did he save us from? I mean, I know he gave us eternal life and reconciled us to God and that and the benefits we have and the inheritance we have and the relationship we have and the peace we have with him is all amazing. But honestly, we heard or knew that we were on our way to hell. We were lost and had no way to avoid it. And so that's Jesus did save us and give us fire insurance. And I believe most people do come to Jesus because of it. They hear that there's no way they can work their way to heaven. And when they die, they're going to hell. That is the reason people turn to Christ. The first and foremost reason they turn to God, not because there's something honorable in them and they love God so much. We're not even capable of that until the Holy Spirit dwells within us. So I would say true. We do come to God or turn to faith in Christ for sheer fire insurance to begin with. And there's nothing wrong with that. Amen. Well, yeah, if, if I say amen, does that give away my answer? Hmm? Yes. Okay. Uh, I guess everybody knows what my answer is going to be. All right. Yeah, very good, Renee. Thank you. Uh, let's see if what Brother Steve has to say. <laughs> um, amen, Renee. Uh, I, I, you, you stole my thunder. Uh, <laughs> I was literally just talking. I referenced fire insurance last night on on uh, on my show. Uh, I hate calling it my show, but I don't know what else to call it. Uh, God's show on on my YouTube channel, but I'm still putting my in there, so whatever. But uh, Jude. It's uh, the verses. I'll just add basically the verses that Renee mentioned were in Jude. Uh, there's only one chapter in Jude, so it'd be chapter one, verses uh, 21 through 23, which reads Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted, spotted by the flesh. So, yes, there are those who save and get saved because they don't want to go to hell. And really, if we're honest, about the gospel, part of the gospel is recognizing that you're a sinner, deserving of judgment in hell, and therefore in humility, desiring salvation and going to Christ, knowing you have absolutely nothing to offer, and it literally is fire insurance. Yes, there's a relationship that comes attached with that, with God. Uh, and, and like Renee said, the, the idea of the question is like, oh, you can't just get saved because you don't want to go to hell. Well, 
I'm actually, in a sense, arguing that those people are less humble that say that than the one who simply recognizes their state as a sinner deserving of hellfire. That person being more humble, like the publican and the tax, uh, uh, the, the yeah, the tax collector, publican, and uh, and the the priest that Jesus references in the story, where he says, you know, this tax collector, this publican, will enter into heaven before y'all, and that day when he asked God for mercy, knowing he was a sinner, received justification, which as far as I know means you're justified, set apart, saved. Uh, and, uh, the other guy, uh, who was prideful about the fact that he was a good person didn't go away justified. So the person that wants fire insurance cause they know they're a sinner, don't want to go to hell. Yeah. I think that person's actually more humble. So there's my answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you, brother. Very good. Um, all right, brother, brother Ben. What did you say? Uh, I said certainly true, and, um, and this came up I think a couple nights ago. Uh, well, well, first of all, I, I would kind of object to the term fire insurance because it's it's kind of uh, imprecise. It, it, it suggests that um you pay for it or, or something like that but I, I get i get you know i we all understand what it means but um <clears throat> excuse me um yes yeah, someone absolutely could uh, uh uh come to christ or it should come to christ um for to, to escape the fires of hell we don't we don't love god we, again the a lot of people have this backwards where people say oh we serve god and uh we we, we serve god we love god we do this we do that you know, it's all we, 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 I, 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 and it's, uh, that's backwards. Uh, first, first John says that, uh, we, we love him because he first loved us. We sat, we, we live, we, uh, we should live as a living sacrifice because he first sacrificed for us. Um, uh, we, we, uh, there's another verse that says, um, we know God, uh, now that you know God or rather are known by God, so again, the importance is always what God does for us first. And then because of that, because of what God did for us, we can have a relationship, a proper relationship with him. And because of that, on that basis of truth of who we are in Christ, uh, God can lavish his love on us and, and every spiritual blessing. But um, so definitely we should, we, you know, I think uh, it, it, for first and foremost, everyone probably should. Uh, I think one of the mo main motivations for a lot of people is uh, the fear of hell. And um, I think that's probably what concerns God the most is, is that uh, people would drop into hell. Um, and so, again, first and foremost, we need to have a, 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 a be reconciled with him and then he will lavish all his love on us. But it does say the Bible does say that with the gift that's free, once you receive the gift, you also have a calling. It's a, it's a package deal. So the gift and calling our God are irrevocable. So um, once you believe you have a calling on your life whether you like it or not. And that is to live a holy life and, and be an ambassador, ambassador for Christ. And the, you know, uh, in the way he, he equips you to do that with through the power of the Holy spirit. But, um, it, you know, so some people, it is important. You come to Christ, um, for, to be, to, 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 to escape the damnation of hell, of course. Uh, but also, um, there is expectation on, on you from that point on is, is to grow in him. Um, and this is, uh, this is uh, mentioned another a number a number of uh, verses. Uh, for example, Second uh, Timothy one nine says, do, "Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel, according to the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began." And again, we have a holy calling. Uh, we're supposed to be separate from the world. Uh, you know, we're not supposed to compromise with the world and its false teachings uh, and its false uh, way of life. Um, and this is also to uh, this is all through the Bible. There's a number of things, but uh, talk, talks about this calling. But in Second Peter is another one where Peter says, "Therefore, brethren, may, be, 
be even more diligent to make your call and election sure for if you do these things, you will never stumble. And by make your calling election sure, that is not a salvation uh, issue whatsoever. It's to, in fact, if you back that up a couple of verses earlier, he says, you've already been begotten again of incorruptible seed through your faith. And now for, for this very reason, because you've been born again, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, brotherly love, etc. And if you do those things, you will never stumble. And uh, in the context, what stumbling means, I'm convinced, is falling for falling into false teaching, which Peter is prophesying, prophesying in this epistle uh, of forthcoming unsaved false teachers who are going to deny Christ. Uh, you know, they, they never believed. They were they're, they're unsaved. They never believed, and but they're going to come with false doctrine, and they're going to try to cause these believers to stumble, which is basically to fall into false doctrine. Um, so yes, we all have a calling on us, and so it's a package deal, whether you like it or not. And if you, of course, first and foremost, you need to be saved. But even if you ignore that calling, uh, you may you may suffer the consequences in this lifetime, and you may lose out on rewards. Um, but you can never lose out on the on the free gift of salvation, which you receive once you believe. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, all true. Everything you said. Uh, I was happy to hear you. Uh, include the the calling um, for me, and I, I think everybody here. This calling, uh, which is uh, what 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 are we called to do since, since we're now children of God, and uh, uh, what is this purpose between our new birth and our last breath? Uh, what did God want us to do? Uh, and it's not the same for everybody. Because the Bible says that we're we're unique uh, and, and uh, different talents and gifts, and, and uh, God's going to use us all the, the best way to get the uh, use the, the talents and gifts that we have. So um, the problem I see is that many people never uh, learn what their calling is, and if you don't know what you're called to do, obviously you're not going to be doing it. Uh, so once we are born again, I think that our first priority should be uh, to ask the Lord to reveal uh, uh, what he's called you to do. How do you fit into this body? What is your role? And then, and then get busy doing it. And if you do get busy doing it, uh, then your life is going to be so dramatically different. It's the, the, the joy that you have, the satisfaction, uh, uh, very few people have any idea about what the purpose of life is uh, uh, if they haven't uh, um, studied the Bible and learned the truth. Uh, it, it's to have this relationship with God and have God uh, love us and use us. Uh, but most people don't know what the purpose of life is. And, and so they're, they're missing out. They're just kind of going through the motions. Everything they do in life is meaningless, even if they are charitable and uh uh, let's say that they are extremely um, uh, generous and want to serve humanity, and they're, uh, it, it all means nothing. It has no value at all in, in the sight of God unless they are a child of God. So uh, these things are important for a person to understand it. We're not just being saved from hell, but we are uh, also now, um, we are on the clock. Uh, on the time clock. Let's get busy working for the Lord, serving the Lord, and serving our fellow man. And uh, not only because we're called to do it, uh, but uh, there's there's going to be rewards for us. There, there is a merit system. I mean, we know that salvation is not based on merit, but we should also know that uh, there is a merit system for, for the saints. Uh, how well you serve the Lord in your ministry will determine uh, you know, the, your merit will determine those rewards. And that's another question is, you know, should your motivation to do good works, should it be for rewards or for some other reason? That's something, it's something else entirely. But um, as far as the fire insurance, though, I would say that uh, I don't know what percentage I would only be making a wild guess, uh, but let's say a third or a half of the people who get saved, they're, primary motivation is to to be saved from hell 
Uh, and actually, when we do use this word, this Bible word, saved and salvation, it does beg the question, what do you mean saved from what? And uh, I'm sure even those of us who, who disagree how long the, this fire burns and how long they lost burn in that lake of fire, we all agree there is a lake of fire and uh, no, no one wants to go into that lake of fire. No one should want to. Uh, um, so uh, I personally didn't have that really as a, a motivator for me. Uh, it was what I was studying the Bible, learning about Jesus and what he did for me and who he is. Uh, I was just overwhelmed with this love that he showed me. And it was, it was the love of God. And the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And that should be our natural reaction. When you understand this great love that Jesus has for you, uh, a natural response is to love him back. Uh, and that was my main thought. Uh, and But being saved from the lake of fire, uh, it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a legitimate uh, reason to uh, want to want to avoid it, to receive salvation and the gift of eternal life. So I was, I did answer it, certainly true. So I, I think I went off on some tangents there, but uh, I hope that was helpful. Uh, everybody had a turn except Lisa, I think. So Lisa, you submitted the question. So enlighten us. Yeah, you guys did a great job. You guys went even further down the road than I thought, uh, <laughs> than I thought you would. But, uh, yeah, you know, there's this whole thing out there where people will say, I think uh, both, well, everybody nailed it in their own way. And then more, uh, you guys extrapolated even further as to, you know, yeah, then now we are saved. We, we are going to press on to the great things in Christ because we love him. But, you know, we love him now because he first loved us. But, uh <laughs> I don't know why the people are afraid to say, yeah, I absolutely did. I came to the Lord so I would not die and go to hell. You know, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord in Proverbs is the beginning of wisdom. And so, uh, you know, we are warned in the Bible <laughs> that it, it is the fool that rejects God. It is the fool that says in their heart there is no God. And actually that there is, I would point out, is in italics. So it means it was added later. The original text said no God because they're refusing God. Uh, you know, the Lord says, I said before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. <laughs> so I always like to say, yeah, in parentheses, I would have put just in case you're stupid, choose life. So, you know, uh, Jesus, one of the things that he, excuse me, John, one of the things that he said was, uh, you know, a generation of vipers who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come, you know, um, if. Uh, there's lots of times Jesus referred to the religious as vipers and he was warning them about the damnation that awaited them. And anybody that had any sense, if you have the fear of the Lord, be like, remember, Jesus said, don't, don't fear the one who can destroy the body, or rather fear the one that can destroy both body and soul in hell. So <laughs> having that fear of the Lord is a righteous thing. Now, when when we look at the scripture, let's see. Let me go to the one I was thinking about when I see I was a child. Okay, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that, who's, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the reason Jesus came to the world, to deliver people from perishing. And it says, for God sent not his son in uh, into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Saved from what? From perishing. <laughs> so, so when these people mock and they go, well, if you only came to the Lord for fire insurance, you know, you know, you're probably not saved because your motivation. No, you're doing exactly what the scripture admonished you to do. The fear of the Lord, the fear of that hellfire, believe in what he said about it. Jesus spoke about hell more than any other figure in this book. He's the one that created it, and he warned man about it. <laughs> so, so only a fool would reject his admonishment. So I always laugh when people try to put that, you know, encumbrance on people and try to make it a, a wicked thing when they're doing the very thing 
that the scripture admonished you to do. So if anybody ever tries to do that spin on you and you're a new believer, you know, you, you just smile and go, that's all right. I did exactly what the Lord wanted me to do. Miss hellfire. Once you do that, now you can, you're in relationship. That gets developed afterwards. And it's just, they, they put all these encumbrances on people. This is exactly why Paul talked about it being another gospel. It is not another because it troubles you. We are supposed to be rejoicing at what a great salvation Jesus has won for us. He won it and purchased it with his own blood. It is freely given, but it was not free. This is what really irritates the schnitzel out of me when these devils go on carrying on about how, you know, we got to do something. We got to, no, no, no. Jesus said to tell us I paid in full. It is finished. He is God almighty. He cannot lie. In order for it to be finished, and here I am 2,000 years later, and he said it's finished, the sin debt is paid, then all of my sin, which was future, was paid for. Everyone, he said, and not for ours only, but for the sin of the whole world. And they really think that the first Adam is greater than the second. When the scripture says the contrary, the second Adam, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, is greater than the first. Fully completed, fulfilled, paid, the debt is settled. And this is why people who are emissaries of the devil come along. They know they got to come at that linchpin. They got to come at the very thing on which your foundation is built. Your confidence and assurance in the chief cornerstone, which is Christ. And they got to try to uproot that and make it about you. But don't let them trick you. It is not about you. It's about Christ. It is not about what you've done. It's about what he's done. It's not about if you've ever doubted. He is faithful. That promise. And that's all I got to say. Hey, you, you noticed how prideful it is, Sister Lisa, when people say it like you said it. Uh, they just want to come and get there. Like their motives were so honorable. Like their motives were better. You know, I, like they came to God for some other reason that's more noble than the fact, like you pointed out, God commands us to believe. So it, it makes me angry because it's self-righteous. It implies what like Spurgeon came against the warrant of faith. That you got to have some pure motive for coming to Jesus other than your own knowing that you're a hellbound sinner. And because God commanded us, the warrant for faith is that God commanded us to believe on Jesus. And that's Amen. the only reason we got to believe on it. Amen. Amen. It's prideful when people put it that way because they're implying their intentions are more honorable than ours. Amen. Well, man is, as I've heard Hal Lindsey say, he's the only one of God's creatures that can be so proud that he's so humble. And the only way that anyone knows what that person had in their heart when they came to the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ and they themselves, if they can even be honest, because it's doubtful that somebody who would say that out of their mouth is even being honest. Because we had nothing. They're implying as though there was something we could even offer the Lord. And yet the Bible says that our works are as filthy rags. And yet they, all we can do, I keep trying to just keep pointing this out, is be like a little child. They can let their father lift them up. All they do, what do they do? They throw up their hands. There's nothing else they can do. They can't take care of themselves in any way, shape, form, or fashion. They have to let their parent, their daddy, take care of them. And this is exactly what he did. The father sent the son to be the savior of the world. This was his purpose to save men from damnation. So then how is it wrong for a person to say, I'll come to you, Lord. So I don't receive that damnation. That is absolute stupidity. But this is what they do. The, uh, I had a Buddhist. He was actually a, a new age martial artist. Literally boast. I laughed. I chuckled when you said it. Sister Lisa, because he literally boasted in how humble he was. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's amazing to me uh, how many of these lordshippers uh, are um, deluded 
and and do not recognize the spiritual pride that they're displaying for everybody to observe. Uh, they don't see that oh, their their claim that uh, everybody has to get sin in their life and, and, and all these things that they're imposing on us uh, as not only to get saved, but to prove you're really saved. Uh, they, they're they making these uh, uh, statements with the understanding that they're the people that are actually able to, to accomplish that. So they, they've got it. They're good to go because they've perfected it. Uh, but they don't realize uh, somehow they don't realize that they fail every day. And uh, it's, we call it easy legalism where they water down the law so that, you know, uh, that's why Jesus had to, to ratchet the sin down and tighten it up. So there's no wiggle room. He says, it's not just when you do something bad. If you even think, right. about, it, if you even right. think about it, you're guilty. Uh, but these, uh, these uh, legalists, uh, they, either whether they're trying to uh, impose on you some uh, perfect faith or perfect works or whatever they're, they're uh, insisting upon, that's under the assumption that it's obvious that I, I've done it, I've accomplished this. The arrogance and spiritual pride is it's just sickening, and yet they don't recognize it in themselves. Well, you left one thing out, Brother Luke. You said that people can clearly see the self-righteousness. You left out they can also smell the self-righteousness on them and it stinks to high heaven yeah that's true i think sometimes i can smell it right through the internet uh, many times uh, as i've seen some of us uh, I, i'm one that doesn't engage in it because uh, uh, i I, I've, my, my approach is different, but the, the, some of us are engaging in trying to publicly dialogue and, and debate these people. And every time I watch one of those things, it just makes me absolutely sick, the spiritual pride that I see in them. And that, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's nauseating enough that it actually stinks. You're right. Brother Steve? Um, yes, I, I really just wanted to add... Uh, uh, two verses and to say it was so refreshing to hear someone quote verses about the fear of the Lord and that how that's the beginning of wisdom and that that's even the beginning of knowledge, uh, according to the Bible. Um, and also to, um, the, the, the two verses directly, uh, pertain to that whole fear thing um, and also goes back to I had stated on Renee's show last time I was on there when we were talking about the whole cuties movie and that I had said that the Bible has had some verses in there that separates uh, a sinner from those who are wicked and somebody on the panel that day said I was wrong that that's not in the Bible and those verses I will read now uh, that I said were, which is in Ecclesiastes 8, it says, Though a sinner do evil an hundred times and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. So, you know, like that, you know, that ties in directly with, with the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of knowledge. And really, the the fear of the Lord in this context of this question would be the would be the beginning of faith, uh, so to speak, uh, in that you have now come to a place of, yeah, I need to fear God because if I don't, uh, and I don't admit to that, then, I, then I'm not admitting my need for a savior. I'm not admitting to the very starting point that says, okay, now I recognize the fact that I need a savior because I'm hell bound. Uh, if you don't have that fear, that's part of repentance 
and turning towards faith in Jesus is is understanding your your inadequacy in being able to save yourself. So, yes, part of our belief is fearing God. Just like Lisa said that Jesus said, fear not them which uh, can only kill the body. That would be man. Uh, and his and the devil and his uh, his workers. They can only kill your body. They can't kill your soul and and uh, and body, which is what Jesus says to fear. Fear both him. Fear who fear him who can kill both body and soul in hell, and that would be God. That would be Jesus. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for that little extra. One other quick clarification, if I could, on the fear of the Lord. Uh, my dad gave me an example of a child as when I was a child, and it always stuck with me. And Steve will appreciate that since he's a uh, truck driver. Uh, he, he likened it onto a big rig being parked by the side of the road. Those things can weigh up to 80,000 pounds depending on the load. And he, more if they're a heavy load of vehicle. But anyway. Let's just say for the sake of this example, it's a regular 18-wheeler, 80,000 pounds parked by the side of the road. He said you can walk up to it. You can kick the tires. You can get in, play with the steering wheel, pull the horn. You're not afraid of it. He said, but it's a whole other thing if that thing is coming down the road at you at 80 miles an hour. So you're going to get out the way. You will reverence the fact that it's a big rig. OK, and it's the same thing with the Lord. You are supposed to reverence who he is and what he's done. And people don't. When the Bible says they have no fear of God before their their eyes, then that's exactly what you're witnessing. They don't have any reverential fear of the Lord. They don't respect the fact that he is God. I mean, that you could walk out and see creation just to see the oceans or the mountains mm. or the valleys or the plains. And they, they, they don't even consider who made this at all or the birth of their newborn baby and as heathens they don't even think how did this child come to be that it's an appointment that everything begets after his kind when i look around in nature they have no fear of god before their eyes and this is really what the wicked is see a sinner there there are sinners that will not play with god there are sinners that they know they're doing wrong and if you confront them they'll say they're doing wrong they just don't know how to get saved they fear God. They just don't know how to get saved. You got other people that are wicked. They know there's a God and they refuse him. And this is a whole nother level. And that's what I'm glad Steve pointed that out because the Lord showed me that a while ago, that there was a difference between sinners and the wicked. And it's a very good point and a very good distinction to make. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, I'd love to hear a lot more about that. <laughs> Amen. Praise Amen. God. I love the example. I just wanted to say that. And I really wish some people would fear these these big trucks because sometimes they don't act like they fear them. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've been guilty of um, um, kind of, um, let's say, euf euphemizing. Um, Euphemism is a, uh, is taking a, a word and, and and making it a little more palatable and and uh, uh, with the word fear the fear of God it to be understood as a reverence for God respect for God uh, and that is true it, it should be understood that way but we don't want to uh, and fail to recognize that there is actual fear and, and that that we need to have. Uh, not we, but uh, the lost, the world as a whole needs to have actual fear because the consequences are uh, they're they're waiting for you. You know, there are people, their natural state, their default position is condemnation. So the scripture says that uh, if, uh, if you believe on Jesus, you're not condemned. If you don't believe on Jesus, you're condemned already because you have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Sometimes I mix up two verses together there. I don't know if I got that exactly right. But so the, the natural state of everybody is we are condemned and we need to have a, get a pardon. And the, this pardon comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Um, but uh, this con, con, the idea of being saved, um, we... There's several things that happen when a person believes. We get, uh, I think there's five gifts 
we get the gift of righteousness, which is imputed. The righteousness of God himself is put on us, Christ, a, a robe of righteousness. It's like Christ covering us. We're in his skin, you could say. Uh, so we're perfect uh, in God's sight. Uh, the, the, the gift of um, uh, salvation, that means that we're saved from something, something bad. Uh, and, and we know what that is. It's the lake of fire. Uh, and then there's the gift of eternal life because uh, we, we need to receive eternal life as a gift. We don't innately have it. We need to get it through faith in Jesus. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, um, and then there's the, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The, the Spirit of God himself comes and lives inside us our spirit and is you is brought to life and joined to the spirit of God forever. And the spirit of God begins to transform us, ch changing our, our mind and our, uh, and that results in changes of behavior. Uh, let me see. I think there's one more gift I'm forgetting. Um, but, but all these things are important. It's, it's not just being, uh, getting eternal life and going to heaven. Uh, there, that's eternal life, but also there is salvation, and salvation is based on being saved from something. So we we cannot ignore that and and act like that's not an important uh, part of this um, uh, gospel. And uh, let's not fail to to include that in our gospel message. Uh, and if a person decides that that's their motivating factor out of everything you can tell them the reasons to believe and, and all the wonderful things that uh, will result from your faith in in jesus if the only thing that really sticks in their mind is i don't want to go to hell and uh, then that's that's a good reason there's no reason why that that should be uh uh you know dismissed or or uh, just, just uh acting like well that's not a legitimate reason or it's not a really uh what's the word it's not as good a reason as others um, that shouldn't be impugned, I don't think. Uh, all right, so uh, we've had a turn. We've had a follow-up turn, uh, but is there anything else? Ben, did you want to add any more? Well, no, I, I would disagree with you that, um, you know, a lot of people uh, will put off, uh, if they don't understand, the if they, if they don't understand, if they don't believe in Christ, they might put off uh, uh, looking into Christianity because they, they go, well, uh, yeah, one day I'll, I'll, I, one day I might feel like, letting God in my life as they would, you know, as a, as something he would say, or I, one day I will, I'll get right with God and have a relationship with him. But uh, knowing that, that you uh, have a date with death and that uh, if you don't be, aren't reconciled to God, hell uh, play, ma makes everything urgent and makes the message urgent. And uh, we, and, and, and even for us uh, to, uh, uh, to motivate us as believers to get the gospel out, you know, it's not uh, the, the love of God is important. Yes. But, um, I think most people are much more concerned about, um, it should be rightfully so concerned about hell. Um, and also too, I want to say about what, uh, I, whenever I say, use that verse in first Peter says, call, make your calling election. Sure. The, the sureness doesn't mean like make it like, uh, more likely or anything like that. And it, 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 again, the calling an election has nothing to do with salvation. Um, again, uh, there's a verse, a, a couple of verses prior to that that say, uh, add to your faith because you've already been begotten, uh, again. Um, and, but calling the election sure, the word sure there basically means strengthen or fortify, fortify your calling and election so that you can be richly rewarded. In fact, that he, Peter says that a few sentences later, so that you may have an abundant kingdom entrance. So I think that's important to explain because that verse is often uh, twisted. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Ray Comfort twists that one a lot. You yeah. know, he tries to get people to evaluate if they're living in holiness to see if they're really saved. Like, that's what that verse is really saying. It makes me crazy. Yeah, it doesn't say make your salvation sure. Like right. Ben said, it, it says make your calling and election sure. Right. Which, which of course, they tie, you know, mo most anyone that's tied to Calvinistic type thinking will apply that to salvation because they eisegete, which means to read into the text, not exegete, take out of the text what it means. They're putting into the text an outside doctrine to understand the text. They are not using the text to create doctrine from itself. 
Um, and I, I would just add with, with everything we've said that we, we, I love that we focus all, you know, all of us focus so hard on the, the eternal security of our salvation and, and of eternal life, that that is inherently written into the gospel, and, and that is wonderful that we do that. But I, I uh, you know, for a long time, I, I, and it seems to be at, at least 50% or more, the only people that, and I'm not saying this to judge anyone or anything i'm just saying this i've seen this that and i that's why i said it was so refreshing about lisa mentioning the fear of the lord and this question is just so great because just as much as eternal life is inherent in the gospel so is eternal so is the salvation from eternal damnation eternal death um and that that is also part of the wholeness and completeness of the gospel because like somebody said what are you saved from um are you saved from not having a good life are you saved from you know uh you know some type of addiction or are you saved from eternal death uh hellfire uh you know um I, I I do miss a good sometimes a good uh, hellfire and brimstone preaching, as long as it doesn't uh, you know require uh, good works to keep you saved, or you know brings you into condemnation, maybe conviction for the believer to step out of sin and live live uh, and stop it. But, uh, you know, sometimes that's a good thing, too. But, um, you know, the just the fact that I think that we may do a disservice if, if we uh, don't include the expectation of judgment for the unbeliever. Because if God was to come back right now and you're saved, it will be it will not be terror for the believer. It will be fear and awe and reverence and worship. But for the unbeliever, it will be sheer terror. And the Bible says in Revelation, they will wish for the stones to fall on them and kill them. But they won't. Because what does a stone killing you do but separate you from this life and send you to eternity in hell? It will give you no peace. So the only peace you can have and to... Uh, escape the judgment you deserve is to believe and receive eternal life instead of the eternal damnation that you await if you don't believe and die in your sins. Yes, that and one last thing, if I could add an exclamation point to that, is that people don't even realize there is only one sin that they are going to hell for. And that is the rejection of the Lord <coughs> Jesus Christ. When people preach on uh, a sin, first, I, with the, the way that it should be explained for the unbeliever is that is what will separate you. This is what keeps you from being able to enter into the kingdom of God is that he's thrice holy. And that sin has to be paid for. And the only payment that he will receive is what his son did. And if you haven't been washed in the blood of the lamb, he can't receive you. So in order to receive, you got to believe on his son. This is what the scripture says. Now, they, they, they don't tell people that enough. They don't tell them your rejection is what puts you in hell, not anything you've done. And, 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 it's, and it's sad. And you'll get 100 preachers, if not more, that will want to fight you in 10 minutes of hearing it on that. Because they really believe it's other things that keep you from entering the presence of God. When the scripture says it is only one sin, and that's the rejection. <laughs> they didn't believe the record that God gave of his son. That's what it ultimately boils down to. It's so tragic. Yeah. Amen to all. A lot of good answers, I think. Okay, uh, unless someone wants to say any more on this, shall we go to question two? Yep. Oh, Ben, by the way, uh, I think last week we didn't get the um, 
the feedback on the poll results and also the uh, the comments. Did anybody have any make any comments along with their voting? You know how you have been reviewing the, the comments people can make when they vote? Yeah, for some reason, I don't know, it's, it's just odd. No one's voting uh, today. Um, so, uh, it, but there was a comment, and it basically, uh, let, me, let me pull it up. Um, give me a second here. Uh, where to have that at? The comment was... Okay, actually got five votes. <laughs> um, the um, the comment we got said, many death row inmates have what they call a come to Jesus moment. Uh, some, okay, so, so, okay, I'm sorry. Many death row inmates have what they call a come to Jesus moment. Some came to belief, some meet the flames. So, um, yeah, that's the only comment we got for that one. Okay. There, you're talking. Yeah, as far as the results for the voting, uh, the, the results uh, were five said certainly true. That's all the votes we got. Yeah. Uh, I'm okay. sorry, I didn't answer. I was too busy preaching. I apologize. Okay. That's okay. Uh, six now say certainly true. So it's it's unanimous. Okay. Um, well, that's the five, able- the five of us and one one other person. So that's a, a long way from what we want. Uh, many people here, we've recognized that you may be new to the program. And there's some of you, you've been here faithfully for a long time, and yet I don't see anybody voting. So please participate. We, we want to get the uh, results from everybody's answers. And so we can see as a, as a congregation how we stand on each of these questions. So if you don't know how to do it, um, then post the, the true false question, and then you click on the link. And then you can go to that link and and vote and also post a comment that, with your vote. So please, uh, if you haven't done it on this question, please do it. And then uh, all the questions going forward, we'd like to get everybody participating uh, if, as much as possible. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I went back to the, the uh, chat there, and I don't see the link, so I can't vote. But well, It's okay. We're moving on. We're going to the next question. Are you ready for okay. it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the next question is believers. This is uh, Luke's question. Believers should not try to make our believers should not try to make ourselves physically attractive. Uh, say true or false after that. True believers, or false. believers should not try to make ourselves physically attractive. True or false. Okay. This is your question, Brother Luke. My question, yes. Did you did you state that to your wife before you tried it out here? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I remind my wife every day that she is a natural beauty, and that she is and she's just I'm smitten with her beauty every day. <laughs> she knows she knows that that's uh, already settled a uh, question for us. Okay. So that, this question is to everybody else except my wife. Everybody else. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, who wants to go first? Because I'm going last. I'll go. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm leaning false on this because uh, it is okay for us to take care of our appearance. What the Bible forbids is boasting our jewelry and wealth before others and being immodest, uh, wearing things that would show off our body and so forth. But it, it doesn't say we have to forcefully make ourselves unattractive. It, it, if you're a, um, if you read the Bible, you see that Jacob fell in love with Rachel because she was so beautiful. So I, I, I don't see anything wrong with someone taking care of, of their appearance, making sure their hair is clean and their clothes are clean and, and they look presentable. It just shows a, a matter of self worth uh, and care. But what we're not supposed to do is draw the wrong kind of attention to ourselves with wearing lots of expensive jewelry uh, but throwing our, our wealth in other people's faces, 
and being immodest or dressing in a way that would promote lust. That's the difference, I believe. Oops, I was muted. You didn't hear my uh, my uh, res responses. But uh, okay, thank you, Renee. Uh, who wants to go next? I'll go next. I'm just going to keep it short. I'm just going to refer to First Corinthians 14:40 uh, in the KJV. It says, "Let all things be done decently and in order." So, what whatever that person's do, uh, you know, there's a there's a is a passage where it talks about. People shouldn't go, women in particular, into all this plaiting of the hair and just all craziness because they had these really elaborate hairstyles and stuff where people could put weave gold and all kind of stuff into their hair and stuff. And, and it's just saying, you know, that's not necessary in the Lord. There's certain things that just we don't even need to do, you know. Um, and I, I think, you know, modesty is certainly a good thing. And I think most women, y'all got to ignore that mess you see on TV because that stuff, I'm telling you, that's not even that's not even real. They call it reality. It ain't reality. That's much crap. Most most women that don't ascribe to buying into that, they know better than even try to dress like that stuff because they know what that would be signaling to men in general. So, you know, only as the Bible says, silly women laden with sin do that kind of stuff. Um, a virtuous woman is going to be modest in her approach, in her appearance. Um, even makeup can be taken to an extreme. So the, the Holy Spirit working on the inside of you is going to check you about things and let you know for men and women, because some men ain't got no business wearing some of the stuff they wear. <laughs> so, you know, the it should, it sh a person should be submitted to Christ, humble, not only in their attitude, but also in their appearance. And that doesn't mean you got to look like you know, you got a sack of potatoes on either. It should, it should be nice and attractive, but modest. And and I think we all know that. Um, but you know, for except for people coming in and out of the world, um, sometimes churches do, or congregations or fellowships, they might have to uh, pull a sister or brother to the side and kindly tell them, you know, there's certain things that may be appropriate. Uh, but usually, usually they don't even do that right away. They'll wait two, three or four times because when a person comes in and they see how other people are behaving and other people are conducting themselves and the manner in which people, a lot of times people begin to mirror what other people are doing. That's just kind of the way it goes. And so uh, it's only when people don't pick up on some of those social cues <laughs> that somebody might have to pull them aside if they're their cleavage is too low or their skirt is too high. Or if a man, I, I remember there was one guy at uh, the church years ago, they had to ask him to stop wearing all the muscle shirts because he was coming, to, he is coming to church wearing them super tight, you know, shirts. And it was just, that's not what we about. It's not a club. It's not to catch nobody. That's not the spirit of the Lord. And so sometimes those things have to be said and nobody wants to do it. It's not fun. Nobody wants to have to call anybody out on that kind of stuff. But, you know, if we do things decently order, we submit ourselves to Christ and we we pattern ourselves after what we see, not only from other saints of God here in the scripture and in, in, in the new covenant in particular, well, you pick up real quick on how we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do. And then what it ends up doing is just being almost like a magnifying glass on the people who are improper. And when it's not in order, they, they stand out like a sore thumb, you know, so. Yeah, that's all I have to say on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. We see we heard from the sisters. Now let's hear it from the brothers. Uh let's go with Brother Ben first. Okay, I don't have a lot to add. Um, because you guys said it so well already. Um yeah, I agree. I think generally uh it's 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 good to be presentable, you know. Uh, you know, uh your hair combed or you, you brush your teeth or you know shaven if that's what your your deal is uh decent clothes i think again just be, be presentable not and not even sense to other brethren necessarily but more i think as a representative to unbelievers especially if you're going to have like a youtube ministry or somewhere where you're going to be out and out and about talking to unbelievers i think it's important to uh not be offensive to them and be just you know look like some re weird re religious zealot um where even if even on that you could be and then that's not necessarily a bad thing but again uh I think we sometimes we need to be weak in some respects for 
for the the outside world. And um, and I think it, it, but it definitely in church, it's a whole different story. Um, well, not not a whole different story, but uh, like like Lisa said, I don't think women should be uh, tracked, uh, you know, uh, dress seductively, and men, uh, you know, uh, try to do the same. Um, but at the same time, like if you're an attractive person, uh, you know, I, one thing I see a lot on YouTube is uh, there are a lot of attractive females uh, that have a YouTube channel and they're almost always false teachers or false prophets, false visions, false dreams. And they heap up thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of viewers. And um, if only they could, uh, you know, it, it, it is partially because of their uh, their looks. Uh, I think that's uh, probably 50% of it right there. Um, but uh, also, too, they t they tickle the ears. But if, if, you know, if you're an attractive female or attractive male, I don't see anything wrong with, um, again, make yourself presentable, not seductive or anything else, but make yourself presentable and use uh, those natural skills or, or assets that you have. Just like, uh, you know, I think that there's certain natural skills and assets that I have, not in, in the looks department, but um that I would that I use every day uh, to serve the Lord, and I don't think uh, again for a female or a male who has a particularly uh, attractive look to you know get behind the camera and, and, and teach and preach, and I think that can attract a lot of people, um, maybe for the wrong reasons, but either way they, they hear the truth and uh, they maybe come, maybe could come to faith, and um, there's nothing wrong with the being presentable, uh, and it, you know I think a lot of people too is that a lot of Christians will. Uh, they're just really dressed down and look really kind of, um, I don't know. Uh, they, they purposely dress down thinking they're being, it, it, it almost uh, sends a wrong message. Like you're somehow self-righteous and you're, you're uh, a wicked, dirty sinner because you, um, you wear makeup or whatever. So um, again, I think it, it, it's in moderation and modesty. I don't think there's any problem uh, that uh, trying to make yourself look physically, I wouldn't say attractive, but presentable. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. All right, Brother Steve. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, uh, this is this is like rife with this is a minefield. Uh, this question, um, because uh, a lot of the things that Ben addressed is exactly it. And a lot of the things that uh, the other uh, you know, ladies addressed that there there's, we have to be careful that we're not propping up the law for starters. And then secondly, we have to be careful that we're not, uh, like, like what has also been said, um, propping up sin. So, um, I think modesty is good. Um, and all that, uh, uh, it depends on, I think a lot of it depends on with any of this stuff. It depends on the heart of, of the person, why they are doing it. Is it to be seductive or, and I think attractive depends on like, are, are you single? Are you, I mean, uh, you, you do, do you want to look like a slob and a bum or do you want to be attractive? And especially, you know, I mean, for both sexes, but, but generally God made men visually and he made women, uh, verbally emotional and men f visually, uh, emotional, you know, for, for the start. So, um, God made us in this way in such a fashion that we are supposed to react to outward stimuli. Now, uh, part of the thing that I have a problem with is, is that, you know, uh, because of this, this falls under the realm oftentimes where we end up teaching our kids law because, and, and really perverse a perverse attitude towards the opposite sex by saying, you know, and I'm not saying people here are doing that, but, but by saying, if you dress a certain way, it's now your fault. If the other sex has a problem with what they see, no, that's the other person's fault for their sin, not 
what you dress like. Now, yes, you do have some responsibility for what you wear, yes. But, like, I mean, if you tell a nine-year-old girl to to wear a one-piece, not a two-piece, because you might make other people sexually attracted to you, you could actually do more damage than good by doing that. For one, you're placing the blame on the girl, not the guy, for what the guy is thinking or doing or whatever that that the other person, you know, said. Vice versa. That's an unhealthy attitude, in my opinion, that, you know, you are responsible for what you wear. Yes, you can cause a stir and you shouldn't you should respect your body is really what it what it comes down to because it's the temple of god not so much as you could become a uh a causation of of sin in someone else no they have every person god says that they are given a way of escape from temptation should you be the cause of temptation no but I've also heard it said like this, when it comes to this whole idea, a little paint never hurt the barn. So, um, you know, read Song of Solomon and then tell me that they weren't, you know, and, and Proverbs 31 and that this woman, you know, uh, a, a woman that was worthy to be praised was, you know, dealt in fine linen, dealt in merchandise, was outwardly attractive, but was also inwardly attractive to her husband. Um, you know, I doubt most ladies are going to be able to catch a guy by wearing rags and, you know, like, and being unattractive. I don't think that's healthy for one. And I think it's actually ungodly to be, to treat your body in a manner that, you know, uh, that makes, uh, n not for outward gain, but if you're treating your body unhealthily and don't look well, you're not really, treating your temple rightly. So, I mean, there's so much here that, that, that we, you know, need to be careful with how we address this because, um, we don't want to be pushing the law on people uh, because that has happened. I've seen it. I've heard it. I've witnessed it. You know, if you come into church like that, you know, you're not saved or whatever. I mean, uh, the the same thing could go for a person showing up to a church that has a laid back kind of dress code Ver and you show up in a suit and tie, you're not being extravagant. You don't have gold around your, your neck or anything like that, but you also don't, you stick out like a sore thumb too. So, I mean, modesty and all of that, and and I would add a verse that to the pure in heart, all things are pure, and um, and the whole you know everything in moderation should be you know having things is not wrong. It's when things have you. Having money is not wrong. It's when money has you that God has a problem. So you know our, I think there is a culture today of of narcissistic ideology that is solely focused on self and how you look and how people perceive you and all that. So like Ben said, you could use that for, um, to reach people so that they, they are attracted by your, by your look and they come and they hear what you have to say because they respect what you look like. They respect that you take care of yourself. As long as it's not to the point where, you know, you're being at least societally improper. Um, and it should be, you should be asking the Lord individually if what you're doing is right or wrong. Uh, you know, is, is what you, how you are dressing right or wrong. And we should also be careful that when we go and approach other people that we aren't trying to be their Holy spirit 
I understand guarding and protecting a flock in the, in the idea of uh, churchgoers and those that go to, to an event. The same is true for any event you had, that you might have uh, some type of, um, you know, dress code. Uh, you don't go to a, a black tie event in, in your, in your flip flops <laughs> and, and shorts and a t-shirt. You're just not going to be welcome, but we should be welcoming, especially in a church event where you uh, ex- allow people to come in and not judge them for how they look up into I- at least salvation for sure, but also to have somebody to be able to lovingly come and come alongside and help them see why maybe what they're doing is wrong or whatever. But we have to be very careful with this kind of thing because it can be very damaging. I know people that, you know, stopped going to church because they got told to leave because, you know, or looked at wrongly because they were wearing a hat to church. I mean, I've seen this go overboard and ridiculous you know, or, or you're not wearing a hat if you're a woman or etc. We have to be very careful with this one in particular, I think, because it can be very damaging. Yes, modesty, but also read Song of, Song, Song of Solomon or Song of Songs and see how they presented themselves to their partner. They made themselves look desirable to their to, to their espoused and they made themselves look desirable in the old Testament and stuff to attract a husband or wife. So if that's the goal and you're attempting to attract the opposite sex into a lifelong committed relationship, I don't see a problem with it. As long as you're, you're, you're not being, evil in your intentions i don't know i mean this is a complicated subject so the the question though is it wrong to make yourself attractive no especially your spouse uh you are supposed to look attractive to yourself but the word attractive can have many meanings exactly and that's my point that's my point is be you know we can we can take that too far like seductive Right, right. That would be wrong if, if your intention is for sex. But modest. That's it. Right. Not of us that say modest would ever equate that to unattractive. Right. Uh, modest. But there are some. There are some out there that will be like, oh, you can't. You cannot look attractive. You but cannot look true. desirable because that's wrong. That's no. Uh, you know. That way can also imply that you don't have your life together. And one of the fruits of the spirit is self-control. Exactly. Operation. So, but I, as a woman, I wanted to remark on something you said, because you were like, you don't want to put it on a girl to make her feel like it's her fault for people looking at her some kind of way. So let me just say right now, as a woman, I will do that. I will do that. I told my niece that if you went around with a sign on that said, come here and get chicken. You can get chicken. And and she's wearing a sign saying you can get chicken here. Okay. And people keep coming up to you thinking you got chicken. Well, it's the same thing. You cannot expect men to not think that you are looking for a a sexual time or sexual attention if you are wearing clothes that are obviously to draw the eye of lust. And so you cannot get mad at men when they continually go, but the sign said, the sign said you might be a virtuous girl. You might have never, ever, you have been a chaste, girl your whole life, a godly girl. But if you are walking around dressed like a prostitute, you cannot when a man continually comes to you expecting that. And so as a woman, I will say that. And I know the question was about, is it okay to make ourselves attractive? All that means is presentable to me. And for a spouse, Certainly, that's for your husband's eyes only. Um, 
But uh, as far as just in every day, we should make ourselves presentable. There's nothing wrong with looking nice or even attractive. But when it comes to a woman and being modest, that does not equate unattractive. It just, it, and you can take some responsibility and know that whatever sign you are advertising on your body will be what people tend to think about you. And you can't get angry at people for continually coming to that conclusion if you are sending that message. Now, I am not a victim blamer. I don't care if somebody's naked and uh, uh, running around. It doesn't give anybody a right to put their hands on a woman. But my thing is, you can't keep getting mad at people if they make assumptions about your character when you're dressing a certain kind of way. And that's what I try to explain to my niece. It's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. But if you're wearing a sign that says, uh, uh, I sell chicken, and people keep asking you to sell them chicken, you can't get mad at them if they assume you have chicken. So uh, I did want to address that. And I also wanted to say, yes, you should be attractive for your spouse uh, and, and only for them if you're trying to uh, draw, a, a, you know, a re like a, a lustful relationship. You, you should have that kind of relationship with your spouse. There's nothing wrong with that. But as far as just the general attractiveness, you know, looking decent and nice, uh, gives a uh, society because God doesn't judge by the outside, but the inside, it gives society the message that you take care of yourself and you care about yourself. And modest does not mean unattractive. Hmm. Right. Right. Hmm. I I'd just like to add to, to make sure I'm understood on this point. Like I'm not saying like to not have some boundaries with what your kids wear, but you know, like, like what you said, I agree. I, I agree. But also like some people will go to the extreme on this and be like, that means in order to, to be attractive and not suggestive at all, that means, you know, girls need to go around in baggy clothes all day. You know, if they're going to go swim, they need to w wear a sweatsuit. Like that makes no sense. You wear a swimming suit. Some two piece suits are actually more modest than a one piece, to be honest. Um, and I'm just saying like balance, moderation, that, that yes, like a, a dress, what is that designed to do? No matter the length of it or the cut, it's usually designed to highlight a woman's figure without revealing the woman's figure. See, that's the difference. When you're over revealing your figure, your actual body, that's a problem. When you're highlighting your appearance and who you are as attractive, that, that there is a line where it can be too much and too, and, and not enough, I would say to where you're not, you know, I, I don't know how to, how else to, to say it, I guess, but there's an over em emphasis and there has been for a long time on, on it's, it's, it's a, it, at least in the church realm that it's the woman's fault because of what she wears that the, uh, that the guys lust. And that's a problem to me where, where that removes the self-control from, from the male believer or the males in their presence, if they are dressed just attractively and, and some men might think, well, that's not, a, you know, jeans aren't appropriate or whatever, unless they're wearing, you know, a dress. Some, 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 you know, men think that they must wear a dress that does not show their figure at all. Or, you know, it's, that's what I'm saying it, that there's, you know, a, you can't be, attractive at all you can't appear as a woman how god created you to be visually pleasing to the eye that's how god intended it to to attract a male counterpart for life so 
uh, you know, th- there's there's a juxtaposition between between that and and like a woman that's just dressed for sex. I think we all know what that can look like versus uh, a woman who completely hides their body out of fear uh, that that they might be the cause of someone else's uh, temptation, and it degrades the the woman's sense of self and that they have a right to be attractive, godly attraction as a single woman to to a future spouse. I mean, God created men to see the woman. And then once we're married, we are to then protect that relationship by giving our, of ourselves to each other and giving the, uh, the other what they need and desire in the relationship as long as it stays between husband and wife. So uh, there's both sides of that. As long as you are not, you know, again, with the heart, but I, I, I just wanted to address that. I'm not saying let your kids go out there in a mini skirt and a tube top uh, and, and that's okay. No, you know, but I mean, that would actually be more, uh, covering than some swimsuits girls wear today. So I think it depends on where you are, what the culture of the situation is. And, and between you and God, do you feel that you are dressing appropriate and not, uh, in a way that you are seeking something else than what you should? So thanks. Sorry. Well, thank you. I, I, uh, I haven't had a turn yet, so let me uh, give you my answer. Uh, first, let me say, uh, many of you don't know Steve, but you know he he does ha- he has an aspiring career as a, a woman's clothing designer. So this is why he's got some great insights. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh, Luke. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was quite surprised and impressed with all your knowledge of women's fashion, Steve. Very good. Uh, all right. Uh, well, thank well, you. I have a question, <laughs> I have a question uh, because uh, par- partly because uh, I'm so unsure. Uh, and as I listened to all the answers, um, it, it was very helpful. I A lot of the things that have been said by all of you, are things that I've been running through my in my own mind uh, when I submitted the question. Um, but the things that come to my mind that are concerns uh, to me is there. Here, just let me give you a couple of key words. Uh, one uh, is vanity. Uh, I, I think we would all agree that vanity would not be a class uh, listed as a virtue. Vanity would be something to be avoided. We don't want to be vain. Um, also, um, I don't think this word's in the Bible anywhere, but it's uh, it's a word we all understand, I think, and that's narcissism, where a person is obsessed with themselves, uh, whether it's a physical narcissism or just attention or the, the, the self-importance above everybody else. Um, uh, and then you've got um, the idea of... Um, uh, ador- uh, let's say adorning yourself, whether it's, you could adorn yourself with uh, a special hair do- hairstyle uh, or uh, makeup or jewelry or clothing that is uh, uh, really, uh, you know, the purpose is to draw attention to you. Uh, so you ha- we have to ask ourselves, well, what are we trying to do if we do all these things? Uh, whether it's makeup or clothing or jewelry or, or just being obsessed with our, our, our figure or our physiques. Um, so I, I guess each person probably would have to do a little self-evaluation and ask, well, what are you trying to do? Uh, are, are your motives pure? Or, or is your motive to, because you're vain. Uh, if, you, if you're vain, then obviously... <laughs> I, I hope you understand that's not, not, I don't think the Lord wants you to be vain. Um, so these are all the things that I think a person has to try to think about when they make these decisions. Uh, um, and of course, if you make yourself attractive, why? Why do you want to be attractive? Who are you trying to attract and for what purpose? All these things are important in this uh, too. And and um, there, there are people that everything they're doing is to attract 
someone for uh, sexual uh, desires. Um, so uh, I, I answered undecided because uh, I wanted to hear everybody's answer. And it, it was really, a, I was quite impressed with all the insights from, from everybody. Uh, I, I didn't answer, uh, ask the question or answer it because I feel like I, I'm confident that I know the right answer. Uh, I asked it because I want to hear everybody's answer. All right, so uh, uh, some people have taken a couple of turns now, but is there anybody who wants to speak more about this one? Uh, I could probably read the comments is all. Oh, yeah, please. and uh, and to give us the vote, too. Okay, well, the uh, vote uh, was just up, uh, posted again. Um, well, it was 18 votes, actually, 18 votes total. And let me just pull it up here. Um, and... There was no one that said certainly true. No one said leaning true. There were four undecided, eight leaning false, and six certainly false for a total of 18 votes. And as for the comments, a first person says, uh, we are not supposed to boast in our riches and wear expensive jewelry and look immodest, but it is okay. it is okay to take care of our appearance. Another person says, if I wasn't so naturally beautiful, I might have to work at it. But since I am, but since I am, I guess I don't have to try. LOL. And that's from Heather. <laughs> um, and then another person says, I'm not sure what this, this may mean something to someone, but it's a word I don't even recognize. It's called any foam, like E N I F O M E. I'm not sure what that means. Another person says, It depends on the situation and the focus. Single and want to be joined with another question mark. You need to look good inside and out to attract a spouse. When you're at a Bible study or something, the focus is on the word, not on you and getting a date. Depends on circumstance. And then someone quotes 1 Samuel 16, 7, where it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so that was all the cop. Those were all the comments. Uh, can I have one other thing? Go I ahead. thought it was interesting that uh, Steve <laughs> so earnestly contended, um, I think pretty much on behalf of women there, which was interesting. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody else picked up on that. I, I certainly did. That uh, he was contending for women to be able to, wear you know attractive clothing and or makeup and it wasn't you know the women excuse me uh here on the panel that were contending for that not that i say i i don't i'm not in a disagreement with his position what i'm saying is i just found it interesting that it was a man doing it on behalf of women and i was wondering did anybody else notice that besides me well I, i'll i'll agree with you <clears throat> i as a male and I don't know if this is because of all the social conditioning, uh, but I also uh, also will first sympathize with a woman. Like I will not, like when Renee was talking about, oh, well, the woman directs seductively. She's trying to attract people. I know that's true. Uh, I, deep down, I know it's true, but it's hard for me to um, put blame for some reason. Uh, I, For me, a person is because when I see an attractive woman like that, to me, that's actually a turnoff. I think, oh, no, no thanks. Uh, you've probably been around some, uh, quite a few times. Uh, no, thanks. And I just don't, and I, and I don't like, I think it's a turnoff for me. Uh, but then also, um, well, I, I think everyone's probably eager to move on to the next question. So I'll shut up. I don't think everybody's eager to move on. I'm not sensing that at all, but uh, it's okay to move on if you want. Well, I've been, it, it, go I've ahead. I've been Brent. saying there, uh, a, a good man would make that assumption and that's why i tell the ladies what is your motive for wearing something like they like i think nori called it the the attire of a prostitute what would you what would your motive be for that and it is clearly to boost your own ego to get a uh, sexual or sensual attention from the males and that there is a fine line and women are not stupid. They know what they're doing when they put these things on. So I, I don't want anybody playing dumb here. Like, right. well, I didn't mean, they know 
what is provocative clothing. And it's good that you look at it and go, well, and you know what? I can't tell you how many celebrities have told me behind the scenes. Now they'll date strippers. They, they go out with these women. They're quick to take them home. But their first thought is, well, they've been from this celebrity on down. So it's not like I'm going to marry them, you know, and sometimes it is a turnoff, but it is the message that it's something quick for them to have a relation with, but it's not a long-term relation. Uh, and a good, a virtuous man would turn away from it because he's not looking for that. And he's not looking for that type of woman. And you may be a good woman and you're, you're projecting something opposite of what you want. You may just want uh, to uh, find a boyfriend. Well, if that's the case, dressing that way won't find you that it'll find you uh, the wrong kind of attention. And, and that is what I was saying. And, I, and I'm not going to apologize for saying that because I know women and they know what they're doing when they put that mess on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, uh, can you tell us uh, when you're expecting the release of your first uh, edition of your fashion magazine? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, and, and thank you, Sister Lisa. You know, um, I, I have I have come. I kind of came to this conclusion in part from listening to female preachers, uh, female preachers that have dug deep into this issue in scripture and 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 male preachers, but the majority is is female preachers when they're talking about this. And you know, some some you know, all of them. You know, in one way or another, some will go too far, and I think some have it right. And I think uh, part of this, part of the reason I am passionate about this is because of the church's uh, unhealthy view toward sex that has been pushed for a long time, and I think has is in partly to blame for where our culture is as a society um, that, that in, in, uh, in, in being so prohibitive of anything that even remotely resembles sexual attraction as something wrong when that is how we were created to, 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 to come together was, was that's part of that. That's a, that is a foundational truth of marriage is sex. And that, uh, that lust has been, uh, overhauled to the point where, uh, we don't, I, I, I don't even think we understand what Jesus meant by lust. Um, uh, the, the word there was for, um, uh, what's the 10th, uh, ninth or 10th, uh, uh, of the 10 commandments, um, covet, uh, and it's a specific word and it was a specific passage talking about marriage and a husband and wife and to look at another woman who was married and, to not just, oh, wow, she's, she's hot. That's not lust, biblically, according to the Greek words. That That is, in your mind, deciding that you are going to take this woman who does not belong to you, who belongs to another, and begin to plan out that action. That is what coveting means. And that's the word there that's used in the Greek that Jesus uses that was translated into lust. So <clears throat> it's created this idea that has, when you add law, we all know what adding law to something and adding a tradition of man that even the, the Pharisees did back in the day when they, when they 
threw on burdens. What did Jesus say? Something like when they, they, they threw on burdens on the people that they themselves were not able to uphold. He called them sons of Satan or sons of the devil for doing that. And uh, different passage, but, um, but it's desiring something that does not belong to you. Looking at a woman and seeing that she's attractive and being like, wow. She's good looking and you, you may even have a natural biological response. It's what you do about it. And, and from, from that point on that, that, you know, to, that, that we're, we're shaming men in the process for, for a natural thing that we were created to respond in, in this way so that we would go after the woman as we're supposed to, to get a wife, the wife or the, the woman is supposed to look good because that's how God created you to be, to attract a husband, to come together and be married for the rest of your life and, and all that. So in restricting beyond what God has, has designed, we have actually created uh, sexual pandemonium in, in an unhealthy way. That's why Jesus said, do not forbid, forbid to marry. If you're, if you're a single person and you are like what Paul said, burning with lust, which means you want to have sex bad and you're trying to be godly, he tells you to go get married. Well, how are you going to attract a spouse if you're not dressing at least in a way that will attract the attention of, of a male counterpart? Now, it's up to what the man does that is his responsibility. And we shame women by by telling them that you, by dressing a certain way, causes the man to lust. No, the man lusts, just like with any other sin. Uh, James tells us you're drawn away by your own lust into sin. And he talks about lust in general terms of sin. He's not talking about a particular sin that you lust towards. That lust can be towards anything that is not yours and that is ungodly. So I'm just I'm just saying that I I understand both both sides here. Yes, be modest, be appropriate. But be attractive. Present yourself in a way that glorifies God. But, you know, that, that isn't uh, also, it, I mean, I don't think it glorifies God to dress like a bum in thinking that you're somehow being godly, unless that's between you and God and you really feel called to do that so that you can go minister to the homeless. That's a possibility. I mean, but if you're called to go minister to CEOs and all that, you got to look the part. So, I mean, th- this is all in the heart and between you and God and and being modest while not while not uh being, you know, if you know you're going to be the cause of someone else's I mean, you know, like 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 Renee said. So I do think it's important, but I do think the Puritan movement that happened is in part to blame for the sex, the over sexualization of everything today. And it's partly the church's fault. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Thank like you. Make, Sorry. I'd like to make one last point, but uh, uh, we have an internet uh, church. And in, it, it's uh, we have some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, biggest disadvantage, in my opinion, is uh, I, I can't hug you right now. Uh, I would love to be able to do that. I think we, we all probably all feel that way. But um, on the other hand, uh, since we're not meeting face to face and seeing each other, we're not going to be scrutinizing each other uh, in, in the way that this question would uh, force us to do it. Um, I, I would hate to be in a position in a local church where we have this as a, as a problem and we have to discuss and try to figure out how to deal with somebody because we think they've crossed the line. I'm thankful that we 
we don't have to do that uh, because it's um, we're, we're we're not in one under one roof right now. So, um, okay, and I guess some people are probably want to move on. Uh, anything else before we go to the next question? All right, man, let's do it. All right, question three. The next question is for a believer. Uh, by the way, this is inspired. All right, I slightly modified it from a question I got last week from Mia Pratt in chat. So thank you, Mia. The uh, true or false. So true or false. For a believer, personality tests are not helpful for understanding ourselves or fellow believers. Again, true or false. For a believer, personality tests are not helpful for understanding ourselves or fellow believers. Hmm. Um, all right. Uh, if someone's eager, go ahead. Okay. Apparently nobody is uh, interested in this question. So let's go to the next question. Well, I'll oh, answer. It's no, 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 that was a joke. I'm just kidding. It's go world ahead. wisdom, and it's all based on pop psychology, and it's worthless. I mean, personality tests are all based on pop psychology Uh, we don't need to understand ourselves better (laughs) we need to grow an understanding of our lord jesus christ but you know we know where we where we fall short and the holy spirit will teach us where we're failing or we need help and assistance he'll show us that but a personality test it's so self-involved and self-focused it certainly uh uh, I forgot how they worded it, but either way, I'd say, how was it wor- worded? Then when I can say true or false. Uh, true or false. For a believer, personality tests are not helpful for understanding ourselves or fellow believers. True. They're not helpful. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, I'll go next, just so I can disagree with Renee. <laughs> Renee, uh, I would just say that... Uh, and most of the time, I I would say it is probably not helpful, but I'm not going to rule it out and, and, and say that it can't be helpful. There probably are some cases where maybe a person can learn something about themselves that could be helpful, or we could learn something about someone else uh, through these tests that could be helpful to us better understanding them. Um, but I... I I don't think we should be putting too much uh, weight or confidence into these kinds of tests. Um, So I I think I answered that leaning false. Okay. All right. Who wants to go next? I'll go next. Uh, I don't have a lot to say either. Um, I would say in general, um, uh, well, 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 one thing that, uh, that Mia suggested in her original question, and I I took this part out because I didn't want to, uh, lead anyone uh, or, or suggest this but uh one thing she put in her question was are they helpful or or are they just an excuse for being comfortable in our sin and uh i, I could definitely see that being the case for some people uh say oh well that's just that's that's me that's that's what i do um and that's my personality i was born this way um so i could see definitely that could be the, uh, the case for some people but i recently took a, a personality test you know there's one of those uh one that most recent ones are the i don't know what it's, it's got like a four letter designation like infj or intj or something like that but the really only thing that comes down to it when those personality tests the really only really thing that um i find interesting about them really that that's telling and that i think is really quite accurate the only thing that you could derive from them that's accurate is someone is someone an extrovert or introvert and you don't need a personality test for that i can almost immediately tell that uh, about someone uh just talking to them or even looking at them a lot of times so they're i don't think they're particularly helpful i think it, it's a way of companies making money uh, i know business loves these personality tests they'll have people everyone in their company take the personality test and then hang the chart Uh, on the cubicle so that you can better understand who you're talking to. Um, I think it's kind of, yeah, like, like Renee said, it's a, uh, I forgot what she said, but it's, it's hogwash. (laughs) Um, But when I, when I was recently taking one of these tests, every question I I, I was like, okay, well, am I answering this based on the old man or the new man? You know, because I I couldn't decide, okay, well, I definitely see that I, I am this way naturally, 
but that's not how I want to be. And that's not how, if I am walking in the spirit, that's not how I would respond or uh, see the situation. Um, so again, they're, they're really, um, they're really only good for the old man anyways. And uh, for, for believers, uh, you know, we obviously shouldn't be walking or invest or care or put a whole lot of investment or stock in our old man. We should be walking in the new man. That's just my view. Um, so. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, Sister Lisa. Okay. Sorry about that. Hits it. Got stuck. Uh, is it too late to tell you guys I'm charging for my answers? That you're what? I'm charging for my answers. Should I, should I have told you that at the beginning? No, you got to tell us in advance. You know, it's too late. Next week. Next week. Okay. All right. I'll tell you in advance. I'll tell you in advance right now for next week. Um, actually, I was just thinking about every personality test that I've ever taken growing up and in my young adult life. I noticed that if I if I if I wanted to be a certain personality type, then I knew to answer the questions a certain way. <laughs> so I don't think they're actually legitimate. Uh, and then the other is depending on your mood that day. I don't know if you've ever done this. If you've ever taken a test one day and came back to it a couple of days later, and you actually will test in a different uh, category or personality type, it may be based on your mood that day. <laughs> So, you know, I don't know. I think if a person is trying to be 100% honest and this is just, this is, yeah, that's always me. If you can't say that's always you and it's like, it's sometimes you, then it might not even be your, your personality. And I don't put a whole lot of stock in those things anyway. I know I'm going to make some people mad, but Dave Hunt uh, did a um, really wonderful study on psychology and psychiatry and how this stuff did not come from the Lord. So if these are the same people that, I mean, it literally came out of the occult. And so if these are the people who created this test or their tests are based on these philosophies, which are essentially doctrines of devils, then we don't even know what we're really looking at. So I, I don't put any stock in those. To me, it's, it's like for entertainment purposes only. But, you know, that's my answer. Okay, and that was completely free of charge answer, but be careful next week. She's going to start charging. All right, uh, Brother Steve. Oh, boy. I'm the lone one out. <laughs> um, uh, I'm sure I'm going to start off with saying I respectfully uh, disagree with uh, and, and appreciate everyone's answers. Uh, and I can see there being some truth in the answers too, but I also think that uh, anything that is good comes from God. Um, and I see, uh, I, I liken it to this answer. Good psychology is godly psychology, as long as it lines up with God's word. There are a lot of truths in Scripture that are that have to do with the mind, and if it's neither neither way, and it doesn't go against Scripture, and if it helps you deal with life better and be a more productive person understand yourself better so that you're able to uh to fight against uh wrong behavior and stuff like that i don't see anything wrong with it and and i also think that um to understand yourself is to better is to be more equipped in in being able to walk a godly life <clears throat> so I'm sure there are uh, there are some of those personality tests that are absolutely horrible and would change every time you take them. And there's some <clears throat> that are extremely well done 
uh, you know, that, that can help you understand yourself better in the type of person you are, your strengths and your weaknesses. I think that's important for a person to know. And sometimes it's good to get an outside viewpoint of yourself because a lot of times we miss things in ourselves that we don't see because we either don't want to admit them or uh, we just don't see it because we are in ourselves. We're, you know, you know, sometimes it's like your family knows you better than you or your spouse knows you better than, than yourself, that kind of a thing. Um, so I think there is, you know, credence toward it. It's, it's, you know, the, uh, without psychology and study of things like that, we wouldn't have things like books that have been written, like the five love languages, those tie directly into psychology that was written by, that was written by a, a believer to help married couples see each other and understand, you know, cause sometimes like, you know, a husband and wife love each other, but the other person doesn't see it because they're speaking in a different language. So all of that comes from psychology. Now I'm sure with anything that the devil manipulates truth into a lie. Yeah. Uh, also when I was a kid, uh, senior, I believe, um, I took a, a, uh, a Christian, uh, not personality test, but a Christian, um, I don't know how to, it was a test similar, but it was to see what, where your spiritual gifting strengths might be to help you, uh, get a better idea of what you are good at and what would be a good, uh, path in life for you to do ministry wise. Um, so that was all that that's another type of quote unquote personality test. So, and I, I found it to be extremely accurate. Um, so yeah, I mean, you don't want to make a God out of it. You don't want to do that, but I, I do think understanding the mind is a good thing. And with anything, it can be taken by the devil that was true and turned into a lie. So that's, you know, it's understanding psychology better has helped me understand my son uh, and his struggles with a mental disability. So um, I, that's partly why this, this is, you know, important to me because it directly affects mental health and psychology. And these things do help in caring for someone with, um, with, uh, you know, mental health issues. So, I mean, sometimes I think it's demonic. Sometimes I think it's, it's a chemical imbalance. Sometimes, you know, I think it's just somebody trying to, uh, you know, abuse the system and, and get out of work and do drugs or something like that. So, I mean, every case is in a case by case basis, but without psychology that we have today, I mean, I don't know that my, my stepson would be getting the help that he's getting. So I'm just going to put that out there. And like I said, godly counsel is good counsel. Um, so if you're getting good counsel, that is not contradictory to God's word, good psychology, that's not contradictory to God's word, then I don't find any problem with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right, well, we've all had a turn. Renee says good night. She's uh, it's, it's late. She needs to get some sleep. So thank you, Renee, for joining us tonight. Um, the well, I think that there's a difference between a personality test and a uh, an aptitude test. Uh, I'm inclined to think that an aptitude test uh, can be very beneficial because that would help us to understand uh, what maybe career path to pursue because we we would be likely to succeed in certain uh certain ways in uh, when if we go the right direction make the right decisions uh because we have an aptitude or a natural ability to do something and whereas if we 
if we go into the wrong thing, it's we don't have a natural ability, so we would probably not be very good at it. So that that kind of test, I think, could be helpful more so than a, just a personality test. But I know that um, there are some people, though, that just uh, the whole concept of uh, psychology and psychi psychiatry, they uh, uh, they're very much against it uh, in, in practiced in any way. Um, and then Steve is saying that there, there's actually been some benefit to him and his family uh, through psychology. So uh, I don't know. We need to be careful with um, you know being too uh, uh, absolute on on all these things. Um, all right. Who? Anybody want to say more about this one? Oh, I also wanted to add that I noticed that uh, Sister Lisa, she said. Uh, Buy a mood ring too. Do you know what mood rings are? I bet you, Lisa. I bet you, very few people here know what mood rings are. But I've noticed lately, you've mentioned uh, some. Uh, TV I do. Shows. Yeah, good. Glad you do, Steve. But uh, it, it, um, Lisa's mentioned lately uh, some old TV shows, some uh, uh, commercials for products, some jingles and stuff that uh, take me back. And I was a little surprised that uh, these things make me really reminisce on on uh, the, the, my youth. So, uh, yeah, the mood ring is definitely what I was thinking. I think that went back to when I was in college in the 70s. Uh, uh, but it's a ring that's supposed to change colors based upon the mood. It does change colors. I don't know if there's any really any reason to think that it, the color is a reflection of your mood or not. I don't know if there's any real science to support that. Um, okay. Anybody want to say more about this question? Yeah, in fairness, I was making a joke, but I wasn't serious yeah. about the mood ring. Oh, Lisa, you, when you make a joke, never explain that it's a joke. Oh, okay. Well, I was just taking your lead, Beverly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oops. Oh, I get a cramp. I'm getting a cramp from laughing. Go ahead, everybody. <laughs> You remember my pet rock, uh, Luke? That probably takes you back. Oh, yeah. I never had a pet rock, but I knew a lot of people who didn't have pet rocks. <laughs> okay. I'm going to read the comments for this one. one. One person says, these are all anonymous. That is worldly wisdom, no help at all. Next person says, possible pseudo silent, possible pseudoscience, question mark. Another person says, actually, this is Mr. Rich Bob. Certainly not always. We don't always understand why we think the way we do until we see how people like us generally do. The correlations can be scary. Um, so, yeah, uh, I thought everyone made great points, actually. So um, are we ready for the next question? I guess we are. Take us a guess. Yeah. Yes, we are. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, here's a true or false question. True or false, God is giving some people today visions of the end times. Who wrote that question, Ben? Uh, I did, actually. You did. So you have to go last. All right. Who would like to go first on that one? Hmm. Uh, all right, I will say so I'm going to be real short. Uh, I don't doubt that he is. Um, the Bible says in the last days he would be pouring out his spirit on all flesh and uh, men and women will be dream dreaming dreams and having and or visions. Um, but I think we still have to try those by the word and make sure they don't contradict the word because I truly believe that any experience that a person is going to have that is from the Lord above is not going to contradict his word. So uh, I would say yes, but we should always try by the word. I don't doubt that it's, that it's real or even possible, maybe even some, some fantastic experiences, but we should definitely try them by the word. And when these people are having these visions of hell and coming back and giving a false gospel message, I was just, talking to my mother about this uh, last night, as a matter of fact, I had run across one of these so-called experiences on a very well-known, not only YouTube channel, but 
this person comes on television. And, of course, just as Sister Renee pointed out, whenever she covers this topic, uh, documenting these people, talking about these people who come back and claim they had these hell experiences or visions, they always come back with a false gospel message. It's always works righteous heresy. And I uh, told her, I said, you know, when we see the parable of Lazarus, the beggar, in Abraham's bosom and the rich man who is being tormented in hell, when he, one of his uh, things that he said was he pleaded with Abraham to allow Lazarus to come back, <laughs> to go back and like, like preach or someone to, to rise from the dead and preach to his brothers that were not <laughs> uh, believers. And uh, Abraham says to him, he said, they have the prophets. He said, and they have the law. He said, if they want to believe, they have what they need to believe. I'm paraphrasing. He said, and they're not going to believe somebody, though they be risen from the dead to tell them. So then, you know, one come back and tell them. So why would the Lord show the, us that as a parable? And I know a lot of people don't believe it's a true account. I do believe it's a true account because two of the main characters there, Lazarus and Abraham, are real people. And I don't believe he would he would pin this on them. And it wasn't true that it hadn't occurred. But anyway, so whether you believe it was real or not, this very important message in there that if he ain't allowing people to come back from the dead in that one example, and he's no respecter of persons, then why am I supposed to believe all these other testimonies? And first of all, I'm never going to believe them when they come back preaching a false gospel message. So I just want to warn people about that. Is there some tell, tell signs as to why we can be in uh, not only serious question, but in those cases, disbelief when people come back and they, they lie on what the gospel is. And how did you have a true experience? I don't know who gave you that experience if you did have one. But it wasn't the Lord. He ain't going to tell you to come back and lie about the simplicity of the gospel and his free grace. So ju ju that's all I really had to say on that. Uh, I'm sure. Well, one other thing. I'm sure there are people that are having some other. There's also these visions of heaven. And I'm very suspect about those. And a couple of these have been proven to be false. People have admitted they've lied. Uh, and, and, you know, it was to sell books and stuff. So. Um, be be cognizant of that. Now, it doesn't discount that there are genuine testimonies, but those testimonies should not run afoul of the scripture. And I'm always cognizant, particularly of the ones of heaven, that the Bible says, I has not seen, nor has it ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God had prepared for them that love him, who are called according to his purpose. So I don't discount the testimonies of people who come back from heaven. They don't preach a false gospel message, and they will tell you, that they got stopped as they were about to enter. They didn't see anything. They don't have anything to tell you, but they saw a beautiful field and they got met by Christ. They didn't really see anything. He said, no, it's not your time. You, you know, you'll be joining me later, but you ain't coming right now. Uh, and then they don't come back with a false gospel message. Those people are probably okay. But the ones who come back and they tell you, you know, God showed them everything and all this different stuff. Now that's contradicting what scripture says. Because remember, and I think Sister Renee also points this out, how Paul talks about his experience. He said, whether, was it John? I'm sorry, I don't remember. I get it mixed up. Which one who said, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. But he was not permitted to say the things that he saw. He told, he said, I'm not permitted to come and tell you what I saw. So, uh, you know, it just, it, it runs afoul of, of the scripture on these things. And we should be weary of those things. Definitely, if they actually speak against the scripture, we can count those things. As the Bible said, try the spirits. And they keep pointing out to people. That's not just talking about uh, if, if a devil, an entity were to speak to you, whether physically you see them or in your mind. Uh, it's also a human spirit. We're all spirits. And we're, we're just cloaked in flesh. So we're supposed to try the spirits according to the scripture and make sure. That somebody's profession of faith is sound and that their their doctrine is sound and that what they're saying is sound. Because as when the when the serpent came to Adam the female in the garden and said, Yea, hath God said, uh, she didn't have a book she could flip out and go, wait a minute, let me check that. 
but we do. So uh, we are without excuse. Uh, we can flip through this book and say, let me get back to you on that. I might not have an answer for you right now tonight, but let me get back to you on that. I'm going to go search the scriptures and see what the Bible says about it. So that should be our first go-to move and also to ask the Holy Spirit. And he'll lead us and guide us into all truth. And a lot of times the Lord will just give you a check in your spirit and say, nope, nope, that's not, that's a false testimony. That's not me. So that's all I got to say. All right. Thank you. Let me see. Uh, I don't remember uh, who's answered this. Uh, well, my answer is short. I, I'm going to just agree with everything that everybody has already said. Um, if, if someone has a, a vision and, and think or a dream and think it's applying to, you know, end times playing out. Um, I mean, I've got the scriptures. I don't really need them. Uh, the scriptures tell me what I need to know. And uh, if I'm living through it, uh, I, I, I think I should be able to recognize uh, things that are happening that uh, are recorded in the scriptures. Um, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical. Uh, I'm actually very skeptical uh, of these things, but I'm not ruling it out that, that there, you know, some people legitimately are having dreams and visions from God about these things. But we, we certainly, well, I think we all agree that we test it with the scriptures. We can't contradict the scriptures. And, and as far as um, elaborating, I don't think there's going to be new revelations, even, uh, you know, the scripture says that in these last days, they will be dreaming dreams and having visions, but I don't conclude from that that there's going to be revel new revelations given to us. Maybe a person would have a dream and be able to say that something that's happening right now is a fulfillment of this, this scripture, and maybe that could be helpful. But that's about as far as I would uh, take it. I don't have a lot of confidence in, in that. Uh, let me see. Okay, who hasn't answered this question? That would be me and then Ben. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, okay, uh, I, I basically, you know, uh, Lisa pretty much took the words out of my mouth. Um, and I, I do think Joel 2 was partially fulfilled, but not fulfilled in completion because it, Joel 2 says in the last days. Well, uh, they weren't in the last days in Acts chapter 2. Uh, when part of it was fulfilled. Um, and uh, so, the, the, you know, um, that's a complicated subject that isn't really time. The time doesn't give us a real, real good, uh, you know, amount to be able to really thoroughly discuss that. But, um in the last days, God would pour out his spirit on all flesh that your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your uh, old men and uh, women would dream dreams. So um, I think it's handmaids or something like that. I forget the exact wording, but that's 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 the basic inter uh, that's the basic of it, of that verse. The key words are in the last days. Um, the disciples were not in the last days. One could argue that it was the beginning of the last days, and the last days have been uh, going on ever since Jesus rose from, from the grave, but I don't believe that's the case biblically, because the last days speaks of the last generation uh, that Jesus talks about in Matthew 24, the last generation before his return. So... Um, Yes, I think that there is people that are given dreams and visions and all that. The important thing to remember is that with anything that's true, Satan will try to copy it and twist it. He's the father of lies. There is no truth in him. So anything that the devil does, this pertains to everything in life that we see. Anything the devil does started out as a truth of God because he's a liar. In order to lie, you have to have a truth that is twisted. That's important. So um, are there people that are having dreams? Yeah. Are they all of God? No. That's important. And I often 
find it very disconcerting when someone says they have a dream and they say that this is the truth and they don't back it up themselves with scripture, let alone us verifying it, you know, after hearing them. What about them? Isn't it also their own or say, I have a dream tonight or a week ago or whatever. And it feels spiritually inspired. It's my first initial responsibility to go to God's word and verify whether the things I was shown be true or not. So if the person that's telling the dream isn't even giving scriptural context as to why they believe the dream to be true, then there's a problem. Now they could say, I had this dream. I don't know. And I would like some help in uh, interpretation of this dream. Is it right? Is it wrong? Is it scripturally accurate? Let me know what you think. That's okay. I have no problem with that. But, you know, like Lisa said, there are so many dreams and visions of either hell or heaven where they come back with a false gospel. I do find it interesting that more people that have a view of heaven come back with the right gospel than those that have a view of hell that come back with the wrong gospel. It seems more so those that have a vision of hell come back with the wrong gospel. That's not to say there are not those who have a vision either way that come back with the correct gospel. Um, and a matter of fact, I, uh, if you were to watch uh, the first video I ever did on my channel, that, that's uh, the gospel, my gospel presentation of, of the gospel. My presentation of the gospel uh, would be a better way to word it. Uh, if you were to watch that, you will see that I believe I was given a vision but I know I have the gospel right and it directly affects what I see in scripture as far as hell and being separated from God and the absolute terror just of that alone, just separation from God is terror without fire, without all that. That was the only part I was shown was just being separated from God for however long it will be whether it's for eternity or a time period or whatever, that wasn't the important part that was shown. It was the terror of the separation that mankind will, will, uh, will experience for those that have not believed. And that's, that was important uh, to, to understand why there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for however long it will be. There will be no rest day or night be because you will be constantly crying out to God, wishing you could be saved and unable to be saved and having nothing to hear, but your own voice bouncing back at you because it does not reach God. There's a separation. And that's the terror. It's just indescribable. I can't, I can't describe it. So, yes, do I think it happens? I think, yes. And I think it will happen more and more. And I also think it will happen more and more where it's wrong. Because the devil knows his time is short and shortening. So he's going to try to deceive more and more, just as God is going to pour out his spirit more and more. So we, we do definitely need to make sure, absolutely sure, we line these things up with the word of God. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Amen. I especially like that last point you made that it's going to happen more and more, but it's likely that much of that is wrong. So, yeah, that's something for us to keep in mind. Uh, Brother Ben, what's your answer? Well, uh, my fault, default position is like you um, is to be extremely skeptical. However, to hear Steve and even uh, Stacy and in, in the chat say that they've had these visions uh, makes me reconsider. Um, 
And but it, it, in some respects, it, it makes me reconsider and respect respect that I don't think God is necessarily giving uh, uh, new information uh, to for people to spread, you know, globally for the, like new messages for the entire world. I believe that's all in Scripture. And in fact, you know, some of these new visions that people I believe are false ones from other people, you know, who have a false gospel. Um, you know, if, if they have if they have end times visions, you know, and they say it's for it, this message is for everyone, for everyone. God told them to share it with everyone. Well, what would be the point? Because we would just go back to scripture anyways and see if it's so. And so if scripture it, it, it provides all the uh, information we need to validate whether it's true or false, why do we need this extra vision? But I do, uh, I do, you know, I do hold out that God could be uh, providing and giving some pe certain people visions for personal reasons, for their own personal reasons. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, Steve, if you have any insight why you think God might have shown you that or Stacy, why God might have shown you that. Um, but I, I believe it's like more personal or maybe circumstantial. Like God could give someone a vision about some, their child could be in danger or something to that effect. Uh, but as regards to like people sharing new information about how the end times are going to unfold, um, I, I'm skeptical of that. And so, uh, but I'm not saying that, uh, that I, I, I do suspect maybe towards uh, when during in the tribulation that may happen more. Um, to direct people uh, and, and not really new revelation about, you know, oh, this is what the mark of the beast actually means or necessarily like that, but just uh, circumstantial information like uh, go here or um, food can be found here or um, uh, preach the gospel here, um, that kind of thing. So um, you guys pretty much uh, gave answers that I, I agreed with. So good stuff. Okay, thanks. All right. Well, I guess we're going to need to finish up now, but uh, everybody answered the question. Do you want to say more? Anyone? Uh, Lisa? I did real quick, just to Ben. Uh, I'm glad that you agree with me. And because Luke laid down a lot tonight, I can't charge you for my answer. But wait till you see next week's bill. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. I hope you're prepared for that. Brace yourself, Ben. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, okay, let's. Um, um, the questions are, are completed, so now it's time for us to just give our uh, closing remarks. Um, so let's start off with Brother Steve, since he looks like he's ready to go. Uh, Steve, tell us what you thought of the time tonight. Oh, always a pleasure, always fun, whether we agree or disagree. Uh, or, or even help each other see different insights into things. Um, as long as we're not battling, but sharpening, it's good. Um, and uh, I, the, I just want to answer Ben on the last question um, that uh, I, I do think God can give us something that's specific to you. Uh, for example, for me, it was... Uh, it was to um, to give me more motivation to preach the gospel in in truth because I just felt such a burning desire and had <laughs> ironically be careful what you pray for. Um, I had asked God to show me something, and He did, and it was scary, and I didn't like it. But at the same time, it's like. If this is even a, a million, because I don't know what hell will be like other than than what the scripture gives us some insight to what it will be, but it was just like, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't wish this torment, this terror on anybody. So See? it's like, yeah. I'm sorry, may I interject? May I ask if you're permitted to say? Or you feel comfortable saying, sure. what did you ask the Lord to show you? Uh, a dream. <laughs> no, but was it like specifically about no. hell? Or? No. Oh, okay. No, no, it wasn't. Okay. Um, uh, I, you know, I just asked for, I, it was a very vague prayer. Um, I think part of it was a little bit of, of uh, why is this happening to everybody else? It seems some 
that are true, good believers that have the right gospel, like like Barry Scarborough uh, would be a great example, um, someone who has the, the, the right gospel and uh, I believe uh, is kind of like uh, Daniel, who who has a gifting in the realm of dreams. Um, and so with that said, like, why am I not getting dreams? And it was so, so personally, it was like, don't ask for things that are not yours to have, but here you go. <laughs> and so it was a good thing. Like, you know, um, be, be grateful for what you do have that I have gifted you with. Um, and, and all that, but also at the same time was to burn in me the desire to more so to, um, do what I was called to do, which had nothing really to do with dreams, but to preach his word. So it accomplished a couple things, but you know, the, the more so desire, the, the more so understanding of, Hey, time is getting short. Um, and, uh, this is just an inkling of what people will experience if they don't believe. So to give like a burning fire in, in me, to preach more fervently and to get on it because this is what the people that you love, the people that I love, that God loves will experience that I don't want them to experience, but I need my gospel preached. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 it's just like Stacy said in the chat, it shook me shook me and I believe God sent it, but I do believe he sent it through the devil. So I had to make sure I lined it up with scripture and I escaped the dream by saying the name of Jesus. But I believe God sent it just like Satan has no free will in this whole thing. He has to get permission from God. So I asked for something and he sent and allowed a dream to be sent to me. So, I mean, it, that's how I see it because it was a view of hell, which, I mean, it's, it's complicated. There's so much scripture involved in, in this, but as far as understanding where it came from, when it was sent and all that, but the point being that it's got to line up with scripture like with what Ben said. I think there will be prophecy like what Joel two says of things that are not there. Like, uh, don't go on this flight. This flight, uh, is going to, uh, you know, uh, crash or, um, uh, in, in three months, the stock market will collapse. That's not, in scripture and it's not you know uh the, the only scripture there we would have is if you have a prophet that gives a prophecy that doesn't come true uh in the old testament they were to be stoned to death so one inaccurate prophecy makes them a false prophet whoever they are um so that's that's another thing in there but um so yeah i mean that was i was trying to answer ben quickly about about that whole whole bit i do think he's also right with that there will be no there might be some things that are unlocked as far as what's in scripture but if it's from god it will not contradict scripture so and uh the gospel uh that you need to believe to escape the wrath and escape that terror is that jesus died for your sins he was buried and he rose again bodily from the grave, proving that if you believe in him, 
that your sins have been washed and covered by him and that he will raise you up again in the last day and you will live forever with him. Amen. Mm, yeah. Amen. Amen. All right, Steve, just be careful because I have a, my uh, yard is, um, the landscaping is uh, desert landscaping. I have a lot of stones in my yard. Uh, if you start prophesying and you're wrong, uh, I have my stones ready, brother. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, Sister Lisa, uh, give us your uh, closing remarks and, and uh, what's the plan for tomorrow? Yeah, the plan for tomorrow is a night off for everyone. <laughs> so I will post some sort of video tomorrow around that time. Unless something changes, I might do something uh, that will be a surprise if I can pull it off. But for right now, I'm just going to drop a video tomorrow night. It will, probably will not be a live stream. I'm giving everyone uh, some time off because... Uh, tomorrow is my time to spend with my family. We get together once a month and I just uh, have fellowship and laugh and enjoy one another and eat some good food. So that's the plans for tomorrow. It has nothing to do with Halloween. It's just the, it could have been any day. It just is fell on uh, Halloween and we, we don't celebrate that in any way, shape, form or fashion. So um, we get together and we celebrate the Lord's day, not that day. <laughs> so um, that's the plan as far as that goes. I'm really glad uh, for the fellowship tonight. I had a lot of fun. Definitely lifted my mood. I appreciate everyone. Loved your answers. And I don't think that anyone um, here tonight, because I, I saw some of the commentary in the chat I was just looking at uh, earlier. And I don't think that uh, when we were discussing the things concerning dress for men and, and or women, um, that anybody was upset with one another. I didn't, I didn't perceive that at all. I think everybody was just making their point and um, vigorously contending for their position, but I don't see that anyone was upset with one another. So uh, just so everyone understands, we can have disagreements or disagree and still be um, in complete fellowship and respect for one another. I think that's why Brother Luke has selected the people that he has uh, so that uh, he's, you know, fairly certain that we're not going to to do that sort of thing. Because we I think we're all mature enough here to agree to disagree. As I've stated before, there are positions that people have on the panel that I don't agree with, but I know that they believe in the, the pure uh, gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, unadulterated. And so for that reason, we can break bread. Um, but I've also told them my positions on things, and I'm sure they don't agree with me, even though I perceive them to be wrong. But <laughs> that's that's just I'm being tongue in cheek with that. Those are not things that we we're picking up the rocks over. Although uh, I think Brother Luke has duly warned everyone that he has a bunch of them, so we better not get out of line. But anyway, on that note, I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. It was fun. Shout out to you, Sister Renee, if you're still listening. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I enjoyed your answers. And enjoyed everyone's answers tonight on the panel. Some of you gave me some things to consider and think about. And Sister Angel, if you're listening, I surely missed you tonight, Sister. You were missed. And I uh, hope and look forward to seeing you or listening to you next week. And uh, Brother Luke, thank you again for having me. And to everyone out in the chat, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for your time. God bless you all. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the weekend. Hmm. Okay. Thank you, Sister. Um, all right, I I hear what you say about your plans for tomorrow. I am a little bit skeptical. I'm I think maybe because it's Halloween, maybe you really are going to be going out and maybe rounding up all those witches because there's going to be a lot of witches out on Halloween. So maybe if you haven't already made plans to do that, maybe you should get busy and get, you know. This is the perfect <laughs> opportunity for you to get the witches, okay? Brother Luke got jokes. Okay. Thank you, Brother Luke. <laughs> All right. Okay. I thought it was funny. Though. All right. Let me see. Uh, did I miss anybody? Uh, ben, uh, yeah. did, you, did you say goodnight yet? No. Let me, let me uh, read these last comments real quick. 
from the last question, the, oh, okay. the comment from the chat. And by the way, um, the chat is getting so good now that it's hard to that the conversation on the panel is just is is uh, the chat is rivaling uh, the panel in terms of the discussion. It's really great, great to see. Um, so uh, with these last questions, um, uh, one person says, "I have never had." any dream of the end time but i had visions in general a lot so it's possible but much more is the biblical witnesses another person says the bible is the perfect measuring stick the message or vision should not contradict god's word and then finally someone says i've been getting dreams about tornadoes occurring in my city and there has been a lot of a lot of them happening near or close by it's entirely possible god is giving us visions or dreams um so that wraps up the comments from the chat. Thank you. And um, yes, Angel it was, if we could all pray for Angel, uh, she's got a, she's a little stressed out because of, uh, uh, because of the health of her, of her uh, some of her pets. So if we could pray for that, I'm sure she would appreciate that. Um, other than that, yes, I had a great time um, uh, with the program tonight and uh, the fellowship. It was great to have everyone here and I look forward to next time. Okay. All right. Thank you, brother. Well, I guess I'll just say that uh, it was a wonderful, fun fellowship Friday night as usual. Uh, and uh, even though uh, Sister Angel was not available, we definitely missed you, Sister. If you if you watch this, uh, I want you to know that we all miss you. But uh, uh, I'm thankful that Sister Renee was uh, able and available to uh, at least join us. Uh, that was wonderful having her with us tonight. <clears throat> And again, to everybody in the chat room, you, you are the congregation, uh, and to the moderators in the chat room, you are the elders. Thank you for being there and doing what you do. Uh, we were so blessed to have this congregation. And uh, uh, join us on Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern, on the same channel for our Sunday church service for the Church of the Eternally Secure. It is the first Sunday of the month. And on the first Sunday, we, we do have communion. And uh, so get your bread and wine ready for Sunday, okay? Thank you, everybody, for participating. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.